Hi, and welcome to our second video on bioenergetic strategies, micro-metabolic considerations. This is a dumpster fire, and you are not a dumpster fire. That is what we're going to look at in this video. How come you are not a disorganized, flaming dumpster fire? The question that we're going to answer in this video is how do living systems use energy, which was the question that we answered in our macro strategy video as well. This is going to focus on the fine details at the cellular level. In this video, we're going to talk about sequential metabolism. We're going to talk about the role that electron shuttles play in cellular metabolism. And we're going to talk about the process of chemiosmosis. Let's start by talking about fire. Fire is an example of combustion. In a combustion reaction, we take organic molecules and we combine them with oxygen in order to produce carbon dioxide and water. The organic molecule is oxidized and the release of the energy from that oxidation is generally visualized as fire. This is an exergonic process and is what happens whenever a house or a dumpster burns down. It also happens to be what happens inside of biological systems whenever they get energy from food. Respiration reactions are combustion reactions, but cells don't burst into flames. Why is that? The answer is because cellular metabolism is sequential and controlled. This is a relatively detailed map of metabolic pathways in a typical eukaryotic cell. The blue labels in this map are enzymes. Notice that almost without exception, every step in every one of these metabolic processes that we see on this map is controlled by a particular enzyme. Rather than releasing all of the energy stored inside of food molecules at once, the energy is released in small amounts sequentially through a series of enzyme-mediated or enzyme-controlled reactions. In metabolic reactions, this is accomplished through the use of molecules that serve as electron shuttles. During a fire-releasing combustion reaction, the energy that comes from the oxidation of the molecule or the removal of its electrons is released into the environment. Rather than directly transferring the electrons from the molecules that are being oxidized, the food molecules, to the molecules that will ultimately be reduced, what we call the terminal electron acceptor, things like oxygen in the case of aerobic cellular respiration, biological systems work by taking the electrons from the molecules that are being oxidized and temporarily storing them inside of intermediary molecules, an example of which is shown here in this diagram. This is nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, or what we would call NAD+. This is the oxidized form of the molecule. There are two forms of every electron shuttle. The oxidized form will accept electrons from another molecule and be converted into the reduced form. In order to see this happen, let's focus on this region of the molecule here, as it's the only part that undergoes the oxidation or reduction. Let's blow it up and we'll see the difference between the oxidized form and the reduced form. If you look, you can probably see the difference for yourself, but I'll highlight it here. The reduced form has taken on additional electrons and has taken on an additional hydrogen atom as well. NAD plus has been converted into NADH. In order to do this, it had to accept two electrons from another molecule. This is what we mean when we say that NAD serves as an electron shuttle. The oxidized version of the molecule is taking electrons from another molecule and being converted into the reduced form. Later on in metabolic reactions, the reduced form will be converted back into the oxidized form. Cycling of the oxidized and reduced versions of electron shuttles is crucially important in energetic metabolism. There are three different versions of electron shuttles that you will see during our discussions of metabolic reactions. NAD+, NADH, FAD, FADH2, NADP+, NADPH. Each of these molecules serves as an electron shuttle in different reactions, and each one will gain electrons to be reduced and then give up those electrons to be oxidized back to the form in which it started. For the rest of the videos in this unit, I'm going to represent these molecules graphically rather than paying attention to their specific chemistry. As an example, here are the graphics that I'll use for NAD plus and NADH. We don't need to focus on the specific locations of the electrons. We only need to focus on the two different forms of any electron shuttles that we see during our discussions. The final widely distributed bioenergetic mechanism that we see in use by cells is chemiosmosis. 
Chemiosmosis is a means by which cells use a membrane to separate different regions of the cellular space in order to generate a lot of ATP. This requires a series of proteins referred to as an electron transport chain, as well as another protein known as ATP synthase. In order for chemiosmosis to work, a proton gradient has to be established across this membrane. Protons are highly charged molecules that cannot move through the phospholipid bilayer. So while diffusion would generally drive the protons from the region of high concentration back to the region of low concentration to a state of equilibrium across the membrane, the chemistry of the protons is such that they cannot do this by interacting with the phospholipid bilayer directly. The proton gradient is maintained through the action of the electron transport chain. Electron carriers, like NADH for instance, will deposit electrons and return to their oxidized forms by feeding electrons into the proteins that make up the electron transport chain, where they will eventually be used to reduce some sort of terminal electron acceptor, a molecule that will grab those electrons and won't let them go again. The proteins in the electron transport chain are specialized pump proteins that use the free energy that's released by the flow of electrons through the chain to move protons from one side of the membrane to the other side of the membrane, which is where the proton gradient comes from. As we discussed, the chemistry of protons is such that protons cannot move through the phospholipid bilayer. The only way that protons can go through the membrane is to go through the ATP synthase protein. ATP synthase allows protons to move through the membrane and uses the free energy that's produced from that movement to drive the production of ATP. This process of chemiosmosis is a widely distributed means of ATP production that we see in many different types of cells, including all eukaryotic cells in the mitochondria and chloroplasts of those cells, and in many different types of prokaryotic cells as well, which makes perfect sense given the endosymbiotic origin of mitochondria and chloroplasts. All you need for chemiosmosis is a membrane, an electron transport chain, ATP synthase and the ability to isolate protons on either side of the membrane, and you can produce ATP through chemiosmosis. Of course, why do we need so much ATP? ATP turns out to be one of the major molecules that drives cellular work. Some of the examples of cellular work include things like cell division, gene expression, metabolism, transport, and many other things. Anytime cells need to move molecules around or do things involving molecules, Almost without exception, they are using ATP to carry out that cellular work. It's an incredibly important molecule for the metabolism of all cells on the planet, and the major metabolic processes, respiration and photosynthesis, exist in order to take energy in other forms and store it in the chemical bonds that hold ATP together. Thanks so much for watching our video on micrometabolic strategies. Make sure you can do the following things here at the end. Make sure that you can explain why metabolism needs to be controlled by cells so that cells don't burst into flames. Make sure that you can describe the role of electron shuttles in metabolic pathways. Make sure that you can explain how chemiosmosis works to produce ATP. And make sure that you have some understanding of the biological purpose of ATP molecules. If you can do those things, you're doing great. If not, that's okay too. Take a moment and write down any questions that you have so that you can get the answers that you need. Thanks again for watching this video. I really appreciate it. Have a great day.